happening now, a Norton Shores woman accused of abusing and killing her teenage son is on trial. Shanda Vanda Ark is facing a first degree felony charge of murder and child abuse in the first degree for alleged crimes that stem back to July of last year. She was a tormentor and the world's cruelest mother. Behind closed doors, she subjected her special needs son to unspeakable abuse, emotional torture, and malnutrition. However, Shanda Vander Ark didn't mind. She yearned to outlive him, and in the process, murdered him in cold blood. What could drive a mother to go to such lengths? The details are bone chilling. Shanda Vander Ark's story. Born on September 15th of 1979, Shanda Vander Ark hails from Huntsville, Alabama. The 44-year-old mother doesn't talk about her parents and siblings on social media. Of course, revealing too much would have attracted undue public attention for her family. However, she comes from a family with a mixed ethnic background and claims to be a Christian. She once lived with her late husband, Adam Vander Ark, but their life took a different turn when he suffered a stroke. He moved to his parents' house in West Olive, Michigan. They took care of him there while Shanda, his devoted wife, catered for the children. She was a hardworking woman to her husband and children. She studied law at two different universities. First, she earned a Bachelor of Science in Paralegal Studies from Liberty University in 2016. She passed the bar exams on the first attempt. Upon graduation, she attended Western Michigan University Cooley Law School, one of the city's most prominent law schools. And the icing on the cake? She graduated with honors. She got a yes for every application she submitted. Vander Ark was that employee every employer wanted. While in school, she learned competitive skills that helped her to excel at her job. Her passion for leadership earned her a position as the interim president of the Delta Phi International Legal Honor Society. And the organization dates back to 1869, making it the oldest legal organization in the United States. She was lucky to land a job as a law clerk for Muskegon County Circuit Judge Annette R. Smedley. She worked up to 40 hours a week and made around $19.23 an hour. While her income was reasonable, her husband's absence meant that she lacked sufficient financial support to keep her family going. Shanda Vander Ark had five biological children, Nolan, Paul, Timothy, Millie, and G. Unlike conventional mothers, she didn't love them equally. Timothy, her special needs son, exposed the darkness of her heart. Trouble began on the morning of July the 6th of 2022 when she called the Norton Shores Police Department. She told the dispatcher that her son had passed on. The horrifying details, similar to scenes in a horror movie, and her life took an unusual twist from there. How Shanda Vander Ark Killed Timothy Ferguson it was 6.37 a.m. on July the 6th of 2022. That morning, police officers rushed to Vander Ark's house after the distress call. When they got to the scene, they found a malnourished child lying helplessly on the floor. The 15-year-old was 5.6 feet tall, but weighed only 69 pounds. And for comparison, the standard 15-year-old weighs around 145 pounds. And if that's not alarming enough, the child's ribs were visible from his skin. Timothy was autistic and had speech and motor impairment, and as a result, he was homeschooled and deliberately kept away from the public. He only went to the backyard on a few occasions, like walking the dogs or receiving a punishment. When was, when, if ever, was he ever allowed to go outside? To walk the dogs sometimes. And when he would walk the dogs, where was it that he would walk the dogs? In the backyard, out of sight. Was there ever some physical discipline that was involved with him being outside as well? Yes. What was that discipline? He was made to run up and down the patio stairs. Um, and those are, so those are stairs in the back of your house? Yes, sir. Are those visible at all from the front of the house? No, sir. Visible to anyone walking by on the street or driving by, anything of that nature? No, sir. Um, there are some text messages referenced in there where, um, where, where there's a discussion about doing the stairs chasing style. What is, what is that, if you remember? Um, following close behind him to ensure he moves faster. And, and who would be the one that would chase him if that was taking place? I had to. His health would deteriorate because his mother would not take him for regular checkups or give him his medication. Vander Ark had simply given up on him. 
Paramedics would pronounce him dead at the scene, and he had been long gone before they had arrived. But then they had their suspicions. They took his body to a medical examiner to ascertain the cause of his death before anything else, and days later, the autopsy result was out. The findings would haunt Shanda Vander Ark for the rest of her life. The coroner confirmed that Timothy Ferguson had died from hypothermia and malnourishment. And his death was ruled a homicide. Vander Ark and her 17-year-old son were arrested for their alleged roles in Tim's demise, and as of then, they lived with G, whose real name was hidden due to his minor status. After their arrest, the details of what transpired indoors were then disclosed to the public. Oklahoma Child Protective Services dug up old records about Vander Ark, uncovering an investigation between 2009 and 2012. Apparently, this monster of a mother was involved in a divorce and custody battle with her ex-husband, Eric. In fact, she willingly waived her parental rights to the children and signed them over to him. She could only visit her children and spend three hours a month with them. Vander Ark would be ordered to pay child support for her four kids, and regrettably, Eric had difficulty caring for Timothy, so he asked her to take him. He sent, and how, how did it happen? that you ended up with custody then? My ex reached out to me um, stating that Timothy was, he could no longer handle him, that he was pushing his buttons, and that he needed to send him to live with me. Okay. And you agreed to that? Yes, sir. Okay. Had you ever lived with Timothy uh, for, during his, his... When he was younger, yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, uh, you, you agreed to accept him into your home? Yes, sir. And who was living in your home at the time? Myself, my husband, Adam, Paul Ferguson, and then my little man, G. G, okay, that's what we've been calling G, correct? It's really hard to do, yes, sir. Okay, do the, just do the best you can. Uh, okay, so they're all living in your home, and then Timothy joins you, correct? Yes, sir. When Timothy's joining you, did your <clears throat> ex-husband ever make any, ex any effort to transfer legal custody to you? Um, we discussed it, but he never did actually sign anything, no sir. Okay. And without legal custody, how do you get Timothy into school? You can't. And without legal custody, how do you get medical treatment for Timothy? You can't. From then on, he lived with her in the most appalling conditions ever. Vander Ark lived in at least 18 places before moving to Norton Shores in 2021. It was in this city that she sat and aced her bar exams. Adam was far away in his parents' house, having no idea how she managed the home. And by then, he was battling leukemia and physically impaired. Timothy's abuse began days after he moved out of the home. Vander Ark was not alone in this, though. She recruited Paul Ferguson to help her. Timothy would be forced to sleep on a tarp in a closet under the stairs, the closet locked with an alarm at night, denying him access to the bathroom. Police confirmed that the room had an overwhelming odor of feces and urine. This cruel mother set up five surveillance cameras in the home while she was away, using it to monitor Timothy's every movement and ensuring that Paul followed her instructions. She sent Paul messages instructing him on specific things to do, and once asked him to keep his brother awake by ensuring he was uncomfortable. She ordered him to throw cold water on him if he dared fall asleep, and he was instructed to leave the light on at night to prevent him from sleeping. Paul executed other punishments like cold showers, prolonged amounts of standing, excessive exercise, and forced vomiting. Timothy was regularly restrained with zip ties and shackles. And Vander Ark left specific instructions on what to feed Timothy. It was customary for him to be deprived of food, but things worsened between January and July of 2022. He was fed either only bread or rice with hot sauce. The refrigerator door was constantly locked to prevent him from accessing food. And uh, a hunger strike is refusing to eat, right? Yes, sir. So he's refusing to eat food not long after your husband has a stroke, right? Yes, sir. Then you don't need to put locks on the refrigerator and the freezer, do you? If he's refusing to eat. He, he stopped. He, he actually he started eating again. He started eating again, so then you decided he's been on a hunger strike. He's eating again, so now we better lock up the food. No, I did the, the locks to protect him because he could have he could have killed himself eating the chicken nuggets. I didn't put the locks on after he did the hamburger or the bacon, but the chicken nuggets, he could, it was raw chicken. 
Chicken nuggets are cooked, aren't they? They're pre-cooked. Are they? I didn't even think about that. But it's okay if he has a frozen pizza roll or two, if he sits up, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Timothy was force-fed hot sauce, causing him a severely painful burn. It was part of the punishment for stealing food he wasn't allowed to have. And when Vander Ark wasn't satisfied with the punishments being executed, she devised more. This time, she directed Paul to pour hot sauce on his genitals, but he refused. He was already frustrated and burdened by guilt. Days before Timothy's death, his mother ordered him to taunt his brother with a pizza roll to see if he was coherent. And when the child tried to take the rolls, Paul took them away. The day Timothy passed, he was shaking and struggling to walk, but his mother brushed off the symptoms as being fake. He tried to sneak food. I yelled at him, and then he became momentarily unresponsive, and then I saw this. He's bone thin, Mama. I think, I think we need to actually feed him. Okay. And what's your response to that? I said, Kay, give him bread, please. And then I said, I hear you. Give PB sandwiches and water. You want me to keep going? Yeah. Okay. The unresponsiveness is probably fake, but I see what you mean. Okay. And go ahead and move the next page. Uh, also, it's no wonder he's hardly capable of standing. Then that's the one with photographs of his legs, right? Yeah, and then I said, I'm in court. So is it really your testimony that you never saw that photograph? I do not recall seeing it. I, that was it. I feel like I want to throw up. Correction, page 6011. Bottom text. I wonder how it would feel to have that hot sauce on your private parts. I'm not saying touching there, not at all, but dripping a little bit there, is that horrible? Did you have to ask that question? I wouldn't think so. I don't remember that. I can't even imagine saying that. But you did. I know, but I can't even imagine it. About your child, right? Who at that point was in the middle of an ice bath and it lasted at least two and a half hours at that point, right? The day before he died, he was unresponsive, barely walking or talking. Again, his mother dismissed it as his usual antics, and rather than take him to the hospital, she subjected him to an ice bath for nine and a half hours. Vander Ark told Paul that she was determined to outlast Timothy. That is, she would rather watch him die. Paul hit his brother several times on the head and dipped him in the ice water. Timothy eventually succumbed to the torture and died the following morning. His body would be covered with bruises and marks. Shanda van der Ark was charged with open murder and first-degree child abuse. And as for Paul Ferguson, he was slammed with first-degree child abuse. The trial commenced in July of 2023. Because animals can't think the same way humans can. So it's okay to do it on a human because they can think Right. They can, they can think better than dogs can, so it's okay to put them in an ice bath. Is that what your testimony is? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Is it okay to put a human in an ice bath because they can think better than dogs can, but you wouldn't do it to a dog? I mean, based on the way you asked that, I guess the answer would have to be yes, but it's just a, it's not okay. the way I think. So I'm not I'm trying to put words in your mouth, but you said you wouldn't do it for a dog. But we know you did it as a punishment for I never, Timothy. I never did personally. But you told Paul to do it? Um, yes, a couple of times. And it never occurred to you, this is not a good idea. We shouldn't be doing this, right? No, because it was the, um, the amount of ice was almost, I mean, it was non-existent, so. So it's okay as long as it's not a lot of ice in the ice bath? Is that your testimony? If it doesn't affect the temperature much. Starts off as cold anyway, doesn't it? Um, not originally. I don't know down the road, but originally I did. That's not what what I had told him to do. Because the original time, the first time that happened was before my husband's stroke. It was Timothy had um, the. We, we noticed there was no hot water, and we were like, "What the heck?" And I went down and I'm looking, and I noticed the pilot light's not on on water. It's a gas water heater. I'm like, "What on earth is going this on?" This ends with Timothy turning off the gas, doesn't it? Uh, this, yes, sir. This far, this far. Okay. And he lied about let, it for let, two let, days. But let, let me just make okay. sure I understand that. Is, is, is it your testimony that you put ice in an otherwise hot bath to cool it down? Yes. 
Why don't you just start with warm water to begin with? I honestly don't know, that, but that's what, that, what happened the first time. So if you repeatedly refer in these text messages to them as cold and or ice baths, but that's what it was at the end, wasn't it? Cold baths or ice baths, at right? At the end, yes, sir, but not the first time. Not the first time. You, you, you apparently needed ice to cool down hot. I have no idea what I was thinking. I was, we'd, ha we'd all had to have cold showers for two days and he'd lied to us about the water heater. I'd had to have the gas company out. Shanda Vander Ark's murder trial. Paul Ferguson appeared in a Muskegon County courtroom for a settlement conference, and there he agreed to a guilty plea of a single count of first degree child abuse. The plea was in exchange for testimony against his mother, and at the hearing, prosecutors said they would not file additional charges against him because he was being cooperative, and they recommended that he receive a sentence that was within the guidelines. Paul was now 20 years old, admitting to a pattern of disturbing abuse while testifying against his mother. He said that he was his mother's enforcer, revealing that everything he did to his younger brother was done under her guidance. When his attorneys listed out the ways that he and his mother had tortured Timothy, he answered yes to them, narrating the gory details of the torture before the jury. One notable piece of evidence that stood out in the trial was the text message that Paul had sent to his mother one month before Timothy's death. It read, he's bone thin, mama. I honestly think we need to actually feed him. He even sent pictures to her while she was at work, but she ignored them. Paul was exhausted at that point and wanted a way out. I want you to look at a text message that you sent to your mother. It's got a photo that you took of your brother. You remember sending that text message? Yes, sir. For the record, this is People's 36A. This has been previously shown to the jury. Um, who took that photo of your brother? Me. And you sent it to your mother? Yes, sir. Why did you send it to your mother? Because I was concerned with how thin he was. And that photo was taken on, um, do you remember what the date was? Not the exact, no. If, if your phone indicated it was June 13th, you'd have no reason to dispute that? No, sir. Um, and you just became, again, the reason you sent it to your mother was why? Because I was concerned about how thin he was. Do you remember what your mother told you to give him after she, you sent her that photograph? Bread. And then is there a reference to bread and some peanut butter? Yes. The, so at that point, he's, your brother's very skinny, right? Was he eating regular meals at that point? No. Were you still administering the hot sauce on the bread as a form of punishment for him at, during that time period? Yes. And did that continue all the way up until the time of his death? Yes. Did he ever eat any normal type of meal leading up to his death after you took that photo and sent it to your mother? Um, that day I made him an actual real meal, some, an actual peanut butter and jelly sandwich as well as scrambled some eggs and put cheese in them. Did you tell your mother you'd made that meal for him? No, sir. Why not? Because I didn't want her to be upset with me. He told the court that the day Timothy was found dead, he tried to resuscitate him for 18 minutes before his mother phoned 911. However, his mother told him to lie to the police, saying that Timothy was on a hunger strike. Paul initially agreed to lie, but later confessed to investigators. When asked about his relationship with his mother, he likened it to Stockholm Syndrome. He said he battled low self-esteem and desired to find a role model so badly. Therefore, he did anything and everything he could to make her proud of him. He only realized his mistakes when it was too late and wished he could go back to correct them. Is there, as you sit there right now, do you love, do you, do, do you love Timothy? suppose I didn't love him enough. No, it's why okay. I'm trying to bring, bring justice for him. Just a moment, just a moment. I don't know. <coughs> but can I say that I loved him during the time you before his him. death? Yes. Did you love him before his death? With all the ways I acted, I cannot. Okay. Unfortunately. Let me ask you this. When did you start feeling this way? While he was alive or after you found out that the way he was being treated killed him? After. So while the time he was alive, 
Did you think you were killing him? No. Shanda Vander Ark took the stand on December 17th of 2023 to share her side of the story. A few minutes after she settled in, Prosecutor Roberts handed her pictures of Timothy's emaciated body, asking, did he look like that when you put him in the bathtub? She immediately put her hand over her mouth and hunched over before vomiting. She then apologized to the court before bursting into tears. Vander Ark showed signs of a mental breakdown. Her attorney, Fred Johnson, stood beside her, comforting her and requesting trial judge Matthew Castle to end the day's proceeding. Shanda didn't appear in court the following day after deciding she didn't want to participate in the trial. She authorized her defense attorney to stand in for her, and Fred told the judge that his client was suffering medical distress and was better off indoors. Initially, the court planned that she would appear physically to answer some questions, but since she didn't show up, the questions were not asked. Meanwhile, the trial continued in her absence. Earlier, she testified before the court, detailing the incidents that occurred before Timothy's death. She recounted how her husband, Adam, had suffered a stroke in January of 2022 and had to leave the house. Timothy began acting out when his stepfather left and said that he had kept everyone awake at night and was restless. He also set off the motion detectors and made noise around the house. Her attorney said that his client brought Timothy into her home while working as a single mother and sponsoring herself through school. It was a difficult time for her, and he described her as a survivor who had pulled herself up by her bootstraps. He maintained that she did not remember some of the events leading to her son's death, listing a couple of mental challenges like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, sensory processing disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Van der Ark also claimed to have suffered PTSD after Adam's stroke, and her claims triggered a cross-examination. Prosecutor Matt Roberts wondered what she meant in the text message about dropping hot sauce on Timothy's genitals. He read out an evil message that she had sent to Paul. It said, I wonder how it would feel to have that hot sauce on your private parts. I'm not saying touch him there, not at all, but dripping a little bit there is that horrible. Roberts questioned why she ever thought of it in the first place. In a shocking twist, she claimed not to remember texting Paul. She responded, I have no idea. When asked why she locked the fridge, freezer, and pantry, she claimed it was to protect her son. Vander Ark flashed back to when she purchased a two-pound bag of chicken nuggets and put them in the freezer. Timothy consumed the entire bag raw. From then on, she took measures to prevent a recurrence, locking the fridge and pantry. Thankfully, Vander Ark left enough proof to help prosecutors send her to jail. One such was that she installed alarms, cameras, and motion sensors around the house. She had one of them in Timothy's room, and it wasn't a room but a tiny closet under the basement stairs. The judge ruled against showing the footage of his final moments to the jury. However, he allowed Lieutenant Joel Hoxima to describe it in court. In the footage, Vander Ark dragged Timothy, who was wearing an adult diaper, into the closet. His eyes were open, but he appeared unresponsive. He was thin, and his bones were protruding. Hoxima told the court that he could see the child's hip bones because he wasn't wearing any pants. His mother scolded him, saying that he was pathetic, and dragged him along. She also said that he owed her the biggest apology in the world. She abandoned Timothy on the floor and returned 15 minutes later, and at that point he was breathing through his mouth. She then yelled at him to stop breathing like that and forcefully held his mouth shut for a few moments. Hoxima noted a moment in the video when he believed Timothy had died, and at that point, the child's chest had stopped moving. Authorities confirmed that after finding Timothy unresponsive, it took Vander Ark and Paul another 18 minutes to call 911. Shanda Vander Ark Sentencing The jury in Shanda Vander Ark's murder trial resumed deliberations on Friday, December 15th of 2023, returning to the courtroom just before 4.40 p.m. with their verdict. Shanda Vander Ark would be convicted of open murder and first-degree child abuse in the death of her 15-year-old son. She was then sentenced to life in prison without a chance of parole plus another 50 to 100 years for first-degree child abuse. Judge Matthew Castle announced this after closing statements from both sides and rebuttal from the prosecutor's office. While explaining the sentencing, he said, 
I've been trying now for this entire case to wrap my mind around how somebody could do something so horrific, not only to another human being, but to their own child. You intentionally and systematically tortured this child. Let's call it what it is. It's torture. You tortured this child. First and foremost, uh, for the individuals here to speak on uh, Timothy's behalf, I appreciate you being here. Uh, it kind of struck me throughout the trial, you know, who, who was here for Timothy. And uh, at one point in time, I worried that we may not have anyone to give a victim impact statement. And uh, that, to me, was made me very uh, sad, quite frankly. Horrified more than anything, but quite sad. And I'm happy uh, that two individuals took time to be here uh, from miles across the country. And uh, out of the horrible situation, uh, that makes me feel a little bit better. Not much, but a little bit better. Uh, you know, Mr. Johnson makes the same argument today that he made at the trial, uh, that, that this was just negligence. This was her not understanding what was going on. She was really trying to do the punishment. Uh, she was trying to be a good parent, and she just didn't realize that Timothy was in such a horrible condition. And uh, I find myself, I found myself, uh, especially during closing argument, quite frankly, finding myself almost believing that. And uh, afterwards, I, after the trial, uh, I sat in my car after leaving that day, trying to understand, uh, you know, why I could feel that way. And what I realized is that I wanted to feel that way because I didn't want to accept the reality of the situation here. And the reality of the situation here is that this person, Ms. Vander Ark, you intentionally engaged in these acts. This wasn't negligence, this is not understanding uh, why, but you intentionally did this with a goal. And uh, I think Mr. Johnson's correct. I don't believe there was an intent to kill here because you would have lost the very thing that you wanted to torture. Without him, you have no one to torture, except maybe the younger children. So I don't believe you intended to kill him. I, I think you intended to continue on torturing him uh, for as long as you possibly could. The why, I don't know. But all the information that I have in front of me, and I sat down and I really thought about this, and I looked over my notes from the trial, demonstrate that this wasn't negligence. This wasn't you not understanding what was going on. You look through, I, I read through every single text message of the exhibit, 2,000 plus pages to try to understand what the heck was going through your mind. And what became entirely clear to me is that you knew exactly what you were doing. Immediately afterwards, when police arrive at the home, you you immediately can, you know concoct this lie about he's been on a hunger strike. He's you know he was in the bed and I checked on him and I gave him some food and all this stuff. You got Paul involved in it. Uh, you know at one point in time, uh, you know you're you're put, you know put baggy clothes on him. Um, you know put clothes on him to make sure you know. To make sure, I guess that he, he looks like he was actually wearing them, that he was hiding his his uh, his poor condition, even though you already received text messages, you know, weeks earlier of how bad he looked. Uh, you know, you you testified yourself how highly intelligent you were. In fact, that's the only thing that uh, you testified to that I think was actually true. You were quite proud of that, boastingly boasting how intelligent you were. Uh, and not only that, but your actions in hiding this child. You, you, you hid him from uh, his grandparents. Uh, you made sure that uh, your other son, G, or, or little man, as you call him, didn't see him. You know, those text messages talk about not wanting uh, anyone to see him. I want to see him in that condition. Uh, you made sure that the garage was closed 
when he was when you sent him out there with no pants on to clean out the garage. I don't want to believe it because I don't understand. I can't wrap my mind. I've been trying now for this entire case to wrap my mind about how somebody could do something so horrific, not only to another human being, but to their own child. Uh, I'm a father myself. I love my kids. I love them with, with unconditionally. Uh, but quite frankly, there's a mother's love that I've seen that is striking. And anybody who's a parent who's married, that most mothers, not all, but most mothers have such a strong love for their children. And to, to, to see what you did to your own child. I, I don't know if there's a word in the English language to describe how, how, how to describe it. I, I only can come up with just horrific. You intentionally and systematically tortured this child. And let's call it what it is. It's torture. You tortured this child. This wasn't punishment. This wasn't trying to, to curb his behavior. You tortured him. You monitored him obsessively. You, you, all the things you did. I looked through every one of the messages. Bread with hot sauce, wall sits, up and down the stairs, sleep deprivation, ice baths, making him puke up food, monitoring his bathroom time, giving him 60 seconds in the bathroom if he went to uh, urinate it, or, or five minutes if he had a bowel movement. You made him sleep in the closet. You threatened us uh, to, to to make him sleep in the garage. You put Tabasco directly in his mouth. You made him put his hands over the head. Work, made, him, made him work in the garage with no pants. And you know, there's two other things that, that, I, that didn't come out in the trial that were in the, in the messages. One, that there was talk of blindfolding him, depriving him of his, his physical sight as a punishment. And the last thing that struck me is, is just absolutely horrific in terms of your thinking. There was mentioning of giving him salt water as a punishment. One of the text messages talks about, hey, tell Paul or tell Tim that I'm not gonna do the salt water punishment. And your reasoning for not punishing him, not was that, oh my God, we can't get him salt water, that could hurt him, that could kill him. But it was because you didn't wanna give him another excuse to sit down on the toilet because he'd have diarrhea. He'd have diarrhea, and so he would have an excuse to sit down for a few more minutes while he was diarrhea from salt water. That was your excuse. That was your justification, not that it would hurt him. And, I, and you did so for what? Because of some punishment. You wanted to regulate his food, even though you yourself testified that he didn't really gain a lot of weight. You know, toward the end of these text messages, you and Paul are talking about not wanting him to win. He's not going to win. I didn't allow pictures to be shown in open court of Timothy as he was uh, when he died because I didn't want people to remember him like that. Of all the things you took away from him, one thing I didn't want you to take away from him was at least some shred of dignity. Uh, and then I also thought, well, I'm a judge, I'm a human being. I don't know how to, I don't know how to write this wrong. We try to do that, I try to do that from the bench every day. There's no way to write this wrong, except impose a sentence uh, that, that, uh, that essentially takes away your freedom. And I thought to myself, what do I do? And I will tell you this, I am choosing not to remember your son dead looking like a Holocaust victim, but I'm choosing to remember like that. And you can't even look at him. That's how he was. A beautiful child with a lot of life in his eyes. That's who your son was. And you took that from him. I'm choosing to remember him as a happy individual with life, not as an individual. And that's the picture I want people to remember of your son. You took that from him. You took it from him. 
For what reason, I don't know. Mr. Johnson's right. There is something broken in you. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't negate what you did here. So besides remembering him like that, I'm not going to let you hide in the darkness anymore. People know what you are now. They know what you did. You're not able to hide in the darkness anymore. Timothy won. And he won because we know what you did to him now. It's not hidden anymore. We know who you are. That's the way that I'm going to honor him. You don't win because justice Thank God in this case prevailed. I can't even imagine if you had been able to resuscitate him. He'd be still suffering. So if there's any anything I'm grateful for would be that he finally passed away so you couldn't continue to torture him like you did. It's a sentence of the court first as to count two, child abuse in the first degree. Court sentences you 50 years to 100 years in prison, credit for 575 days. Court is exceeding guidelines in this case. Uh, the court finds that the amount of torture that I've indicated uh, in terms of the long-term suffering that Mr. Vander, or excuse me, Mr. Ferguson, Timothy went through uh, justifies and a reasonable grounds to depart from the guidelines. Uh, the used to be the standard was the guidelines. If the guidelines didn't take into consideration all the elements, I don't think they would take into consideration the amount of absolute, systematic, consistent torture uh, that you engaged in here. I think that's enough reasons to justify departing from the guidelines. There's a $68 state cost, $130 crime victim rights assessment. As to count one, uh, felony murder. It's a sentence of the court. You serve a term within the Michigan Department of Corrections for the rest of your natural life without parole. Meanwhile, the hearing began with the victim impact statements. Millie and Nolan Ferguson, Timothy's older siblings, appeared at the Muskegon County Courthouse. They thanked the judge for ending the months-long trial full of hardships and said the verdict allows them to move forward in the process of grieving for their brother. Millie took the stand first. She's two years Timothy Sr. She regretted not hugging, teasing, or expressing her love for him often. She recalled that she last saw him at her brother's wedding, but did not dance with him as much as she had desired. But then, it's already late. Sadly, she couldn't protect her younger brother from her mother and said with tears rolling freely down her cheeks, she ended her statement by declaring that the woman who killed her little brother faced the highest punishment possible. Nolan Ferguson took the microphone next. He regretted that he could never bring his brother back, and as a result, his killer should never have her freedom. He labeled his mother a murderer who had snatched the life of a sweet little blue-eyed boy. Vander Ark took her eyes away from her children as they read their statements, and when offered a chance to speak, she declined, instead shaking her head to indicate no. In the meantime, Paul Ferguson was recently sentenced to a minimum of 30 years with a maximum of 100 years in prison. The judge saying that he didn't believe he was any better than his mother, and if anything, he was worse. Mr. Ferguson, anything you wish to say prior to sentencing? Um. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> what reasons could justify my actions? I could make up a thousand and never believe one. What words could voice my regrets? I can think of millions, yet never feel it's enough. If I could do it all again and do it right, I would. I feel I will pay for my choices and yet never feel better because he's still gone. I have had time to think during my time in Muskegon County Jail, and I've realized many things about myself that I might never have, other, have considered otherwise. My problems and flaws, to put it simply, are the place to begin correction of self. I asked the judge for nothing more than mercy and fairness, to offer me compassion so I might learn from him. I only hope to better myself in the coming days, 
and serve my time with what little honor I have left, and to make right my faults in search of a better tomorrow. Be sure to share your thoughts on this story. Should Paul have gotten a lesser sentence or a worse one than his mother in the murder trial? Drop your thoughts in the comments box below. Be sure you're subscribed, and I'll see you next time.